Are we uh, are we rolling, Lola? Okay. Last time we uh, we began to examine the 19th century, and by the 19th century we mean the 1800s. We saw how the, some of the ideas that were born in this period, period of time began to affect the Christian view of the gospel and the concept of revival. So today we're going to concentrate in the consequences of ideas. Of our focus would be the understanding of how these ideas have shaped our American Christianity and what we know as evangelism today in the modern church. So in our last lesson, we began to examine the 19th century with the objective of understanding how the ideas and concepts that were integrated into Christianity at that time have shaped and affected the American experience of Christianity. Now what this means is that many of these practices and methods of the modern church today especially when it comes about evangelism, these were born during this period of time. And so we see that uh, that great emphasis is set on emotions and feelings, and this gives way to what is known as religious manipulation. Religious mani manipulation. Uh, um, again, I'm missing one letter here. <laughs> I cleaned the board, you know, so you can read it, and I'm messing it up. Okay. Religious manipulations. Now, to know and proclaim truth and the gospel under this view, I'm referring to religious manipulations, are no longer the prime target, but the human experience and the emotion and feelings do become the prime objective. So, in other words, the mind, the human mind, is no longer the gateway to the heart, but emotions do become the means by which the heart, and by heart we mean the being, the soul, is rich. Now this uh, concept is contrary to, to the biblical admonition. I like what Arsis Pro once said. So, beloved, God reaches the heart of man. Christianity is a religion of the heart. But the way God reaches the heart is by the mind. That is, we see in Christianity that the admonition of the Bible is always to renew the mind. That is always the exhortation of the apostle. We see that in Romans chapter 12. He calls us to, to the renewing of our minds. He speaks about our minds being renewed, being sanctified. Now, under this 
new methods, this shifting in the uh, 19th century, we begin to see that that is begin, begins to set us, be set aside and a premium begins to be set on the emotion. Now, this is very, very dangerous for us as Christians. We see this arriving, for example, in modern worship. Why? Borrowing from Alistair Begg in one of his lectures, he's talking about the modern, the modern uh, worship leader. He says he, he comes to the stage and he is primped up, cheery, and he says, how's everybody feeling today? Right? And he says, don't ask me how I feel. This morning, I fought with my wife on the way to church. The kids were misbehaving. I kicked the dog. Don't ask me how I feel. He said, ask me the truth that I know about God. So, from the outset, it is imperative for us to understand that feelings and emotions are valid things so long as we do understand that they ought to be the outcome of what we know of God instead of make them the means by which we know God. Do we get, do we get that? The Bible in collective worship does not call for us to disconnect our brains and go by our emotions, but the Bible says that we ought to love the Lord our God with all of our hearts, with all of our minds, with all of our souls, and all of our strength. Every essential part of the human being must be engaged in the act of worship. So coming back to this, now this, referring to religious manipulation, was done to stimulate the human psyche, to stimulate the human will to make a decision for God. Now this begins to happen in the 19th century. Let me repeat that. This was done with the purpose to stimulate the emotions, the human psyche, in order to get the individual to make a decision for God. Now there's a lot of a lot of presuppositions to the statement which we're going to dissect as we go, but let me move on. So, the salvation of man it was no longer viewed as a supernatural work of God. Under this view, the salvation of man was no longer viewed as, a, as the supernatural work of God, but it became the product of the human will by the power of excitement and manipulation. Now, do we understand that? Do, do, do we get what, what, what is the implication of this shifting in, in the way that we view salvation? Salvation, is start, st under this view, Stop being a supernatural work of God. The implication of that statement is that salvation, then be, uh, under this view, if we think that salvation is a supernatural work of God, then by implication we think, therefore, that salvation is something that only God can bring about. So understanding what is our part in this and what is not a part makes all the difference because if we do understand that we have a part, yes, but that part of that part is not for us to convert, neither to seal the deal. Let 
But we are given the part of being the heralds, the proclaimers of the gospel. But nowhere in scripture says that we have the power to change the soul. Now this is essential for us to understand where we, uh, how these things begin to develop. Remember, this is in the 19th century, 1800s. This is coming out of the Enlightenment. We remember that the Enlightenment is that period of time in the 1700s where practically man breaks his shackles from religion. Like Voltaire said once, destroy the infamous thing, referring to Christianity. Nietzsche said that God was dead. Some theologians like Rudolf Bultmann said, we can no longer believe in the supernatural aspects of the Bible and yet believe in modern science. So, there was a paradigm shifting in the way men life. And this, this gave way to an optimism in the world of philosophy because now men broke free finally from the Bible and from the, 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 the boundaries that the Bible set and the boundaries that the church set upon the human being. Now we were free to think by ourselves like some other philosophers said. Dare to think by yourself. Right? We hear that, think, of, think outside the box today. Right? The, those are consequences. Yeah, so, so we come into the 1800s, and these challenges by human thinkers to the Bible and the authority of the Bible gave way to this kind of thinking in the church, where elements of the Bible that challenged the human reason were removed or compromised by Christians. This is a greater example of this way of thinking is, for example, the edition of the Bible that Thomas Jefferson uh, presented to, to the American public. He demythologized the Bible. What I mean by that is that he removed all the parts of the Bible that presented supernatural acts of God. For example, when Jesus walked on water, he shafted that away. Because that challenged his human reason. He could, not un he could not understand how it was that possible. Therefore, he discarded it as being truth. Yeah. Right. The approach of Satan is always the same. He attacks the foundation, which is scripture. So this gave way to this. So don't go to sleep in, in here, please. Just bear with me. Let me build my case. So, salvation, therefore, was no longer viewed as a supernatural work of God, but salvation became the product of the human will by the power of the excitement and manipulation. Now, this also brought about uh, that the view that God's truth and glory is no longer the objective, but salvation of man is. Now, why is this important for us to, to realize? Do you, do you realize the glory of God stopped being the objective for evangelism and the salvation of men became the objective? Now, what is the problem with this? What happens? What happens when we lose sight of this reality. The moment we lose, we lose sight of the goal for evangelism, we, are, we have lost everything. Because we need to understand that the primary goal for evangelism is the, is the glory of God. And that men getting saved are but the means to obtain this goal. When we, men, uh, when we make man's salvation the primary objective of our evangelism, then follows that we are ready to do whatever it takes to obtain our goal, and Jesus becomes 
only a means, only a stepping stone to this goal. Now, this also gives way to a low view of God and His holiness. Under this view, many times, God's holiness gets violated under this view. Now, ask me why. <laughs> why? If saving men is our main, our main objective, then I will do whatever it takes to save men and even to elevate men to the detriment of God's holiness. Yes, that gives way to pragmatism, correct. Now, let me give you a few examples of this. So we see we can grasp the, the problem here. I'm pretty sure you have heard this saying, if God had a wallet, he will carry a picture of you. Right, we have heard that before. Or, I saw this one yesterday, actually, I went to the store. I may not, it did infuriate me, actually. I may not be perfect. Listen, I may not be perfect. But, but Jesus thought that I'm to die for. Okay? Now, that sounds, sounds great, right? Oh, let us think through this. What is happening here? If we make the salvation of men the primary objective for evangelism, you've got to understand that if that is your goal, you will use whatever, whatever means necessary to obtain this goal. And God just becomes a means to that goal. Jesus just becomes a stepping stone. Do, do we understand that? Now, that gives way to a, uh, to a, to an, uh, to a unbiblical view of men, an unbiblical view of God. Because under this, let, let us just examine that statement just for, for, for a moment. I may not be perfect, right? Yes, we agree, we are not. But this uh, uh, T-shirt said, but Jesus thought that I'm to die for. Now, what is the assumption, assumption in this statement? He, practically, they're saying that I may not be perfect, but Jesus thought that, I, that I'm to die for, that I'm worth dying for. Okay, right. So, worthy, thank you. So this, this, this assumes that humans are intrinsically value, valuable. That Jesus cannot help himself but to die for us. Now let us, let us work through that. This presents a false view of mankind that is an elevated view of mankind, this presupposes that there is something attractive and intrinsically valuable in man, something that would compel God to save men. Now, a principle that I will continue to implement is this. We don't care what man has to say. The question is, what does the Bible say? Right? We always come back to that principle. We're not going to argue because when we argue amongst ourselves based on just in human opinions, it's just a matter of who has a bigger stick. So let us go to the standard and see what, what the Bible says, what the Word of God says. So let us go to Romans chapter 9, verse 18. Now, in this passage, the apostle is presenting to us the anthropological view of mankind. What does that mean? That is, this is how God sees humanity. This is the biblical view of humanity. This is what we are. 
This is who we are. And based upon this, we ought to understand ourselves and we ought to apprehend also the grace of God. So let us read. The Apostle reads, beginning in verse 9, Romans 3, verse 9 through 18. He has a question. He says, what then? Are we Jews any better off? Not at all. For we had already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. Now here the Apostle begins to quote from several parts of the Old Testament. And he says, none is righteous. No, not one. No, not one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. Now let, let us not just pass through that statement. Yeah, not only not worth, we are worthless. Now that's, that's the biblical view of man. So it is on the light, or rather in the gloominess of this statement, that we ought to understand the grace of God. Now that statement that I may not be perfect, but Christ thought that I'm worth dying for assumes a contrary view to this. Assumes that we are worth something. It presents men in a higher view. Elevates men to the detriment of the deity. We've got to understand that everything that God does to save us is a pure act of grace. Do we understand that? Think about it. The moment that Adam and Eve sin, in what stage does Adam and Eve left us? What is the condition? We're in death. death. Right? So, if we do not understand that at the moment they sin, they're found naked, and God clothed them, it was an act of grace. It was an act of grace. Everything that happens thenceforth is an act of grace. No matter what. Now, this is important for us to understand. Now, Paul continues. He says, no one does good. Not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. Venom of vipers are under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. In their path are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. The apostle is not speaking with a forked tongue, right? He is telling us exactly who we are. Now, under this view, God is therefore represented as, a, as an infatuated deity, a lovesick puppy, like some of our songs have presented to be. God is over the moon about us, right? He's crazy about us. A low view. Now, why is this allowed? Why is this allowed in our churches? Because we have men in our objective, and we are willing to trample and violate the holiness of God because we have men as our prime target. More of that. So the only problem with this is that this violates the integrity of God and brings him to a lower level than what scriptures 
describes him to be. Now the psalmist tells us, right, Psalms 50 says this. This is in regards of hypocrisy and lowering the standards of God. says this, listen. These things you have done, and I have been silent. You thought that I was one like you. But now I rebuke you and lay the charge before you. Right? Every time we bring God lower, that is, understand every time you go outside Scripture and try to understand God by your own reason and understanding apart from what He has described Himself to be in Scripture, you are dabbling in idolatry. You're shaping a God in your own image. Brother was talking about it this morning. Right? Every time we go beyond Scripture, we will end up always with, with idolatry. So what is the point? The point is that when we make man the goal of our evangelism, which this is what indeed happened in the 18th century, we lose sight of the holiness of God and we become pragmatic. Pragmatism is the application of practical solutions to apparent problems. Now, what is the problem with that? I don't want to confuse you. Evangelism is not our problem to resolve or to solve. The results of evangelism do not depend on our ability to convince people. Okay? Therefore, it's not a problem for us to resolve. Let us understand that. So, the admonition to this is this. The goal for evangelism is the glory of God. Okay? And the observation of his holiness as the primary means and guidance for our service rendered to him. What I mean by that is this. When you violate the holiness of God, you lost your goal. Because you cannot glorify God when you are violating His holiness. Do we understand that? We must fear God. We'll, we'll look into that later when we go to, uh, to the, through, the, through a series in studying the holiness of God. So now let us go back to this right quick. Um, so the pioneer, Mr. Charles Grandison Finney. Charles. Finney. He is the pioneer. He's a uh, Perhaps the pioneer in promoting the shifting in the way the church view the act of salvation and the means by which this is accomplished. We said that uh, that was, <clears throat> that was uh, Finney. This man was Finney. Uh, now, Finney was born in Connecticut, although he was raised in uh, Upper State, New York. He was born in 1792. And he died in 1875. He had a very long and influential life. Now, Charles Finney is recognized by most church historians as one of the most influential preachers and theologians of the 19th century. Now, the last time I told you that he was a heretic. He was a heretic. Uh, Finney wrote his systematic theology. He... Uh, he, was a, he started as a Presbyterian minister, although he was not trained in theology, 
He was a, uh, previous to that, he was a lawyer. He left the Presbyterian Church because he hated, he hated the, the doctrines that the Presbyterian Church adhered to. And he went on and he wrote his systematic theology. And like Bob, uh, Bob Godfrey said in his series in regards to Finney, he said that one of the most ghastly things he said, he said the Westminster Confession of Faith is worse than the Pope. And why he said that? Because he said, the Pope at least die, and then you get a new one, he says. But the Westminster Confession of Faith never dies. He hates that. Now, this is from a fellow who used to be a Presbyterian. He hated Presbyterians. He hated them with a passion. So, we saw in our last lecture how Feeney introduced to the church uh, what, we, uh, what became known as the new measures. The new measures. Now, these new measures began to take place during, during what, we, uh, what, were, uh, what were called protractive meetings. Now, they were called protractive meetings because... Uh, there, this was a series, he, Finney will come to town, right? Let's say he will come to town and he will begin to preach all the week, through, all throughout the week, first week, second week, third week. Now this was done to stimulate the interest of the people and to build up momentum, okay? To, to create, create excitement. Now, this later became known as the Crusades, right? Bill Graham used to do Crusades. Now, in the eyes of many, especially on the liberal side in Christianity today, Finney is viewed as in the line of this key evangelist that God raises in the generations. For example, we have, uh, if you go to the Moody Institute in Chicago, you will see that they have in one of their walls, uh, they have George Whitfield, they have Charles Finney, after Charles Finney they have Dwyer L. Moody, after that Billy Sunday, and then after that Billy Graham. So he's looked upon in this line of key evangelists, you know, by many, by many historians. The problem is that he was a heretic. And many people do not read his systematic theology, therefore they do not know what he taught. So, these protect, protractive, protractive meetings were designed, therefore, to create excitement. Now, these meetings later, as we said, became known as crusades. So, it was during these revival meetings that Feeney began to implement the so-called new measures. Now, some of these new measures were excitement and then uh, technology. Now, what do I mean by that? Finney said, and he, he wrote a book about revivals. And, and, and this is a manual for revivals, okay? And Finney said that in order, in order to save people, we needed excitement. And then he said, we cannot have excitement if we do not have something new. Okay? So something new always needed to be added and remember, this is in the context of evangelism. This is in the context of reaching people out. So later, this gave way to uh, the playing of music in the background. This also gave way to the altar call. Right? We talked about it last week. Right? Finney also, my, my son is actually in the spot right now. Finney also invented the anxious bench. Why? Because, you see, Finney was a very powerful preacher, and he was your poster boy for the, the uh, uh, brain, brain and, 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 and health, you know, hell preacher, you know, brimstone, uh, hell preacher, fire and brimstone. So he will say, if you are 
right now being convinced. And if you're beginning to feel anxious about your soul, come to the front bench and I will preach to you so that God may save you. Now this also gives a way to uh, set an emphasis on coming up front. Coming to the front bench became a synonym to come to be saved. Okay? Now, what, what happens there, the assumption is this, that if you wanted to be saved, you needed to come up front. Okay? You understand that? Later that evolved into the altar call. Now, we talked about it last week. We said an altar call is not a bad thing so long it's done biblically. The altar call must be to call and re to repent and believe, not to come up front here to be saved, as if God cannot save you back there. Okay? But later, this, this is what, uh, it becomes that. So, Finney's revival definition is one of the key elements that changed the American evangelism experience and the way revival was viewed by Christians. Let me repeat that. The way he viewed revivals, the way he viewed a revival, the, 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 his concept of a revival changed the way Americans view revival. You see, the, the conservative traditional view of a revival was this. Revival is the supernatural work of God. We can work for it, we can pray for it, but we cannot produce it. Do we understand that? We can work for it, we can pray for it, but we cannot produce it. We can't. Now, Phoenix said this, and this is how he begins to show his view, his worldview, as he was affected by the ideas of his day, this, this enlightenment uh, philosophy and worldview, he said this, if you want a revival, you can have a revival. There is absolutely nothing supernatural about revival. We can have revival whenever we use the means of grace that God has given us. Okay? So, what is he saying? What he's saying is this. If we work hard, and remember, under that goes the assumption that we have the power to, to, to save. We, we can create revival if we use the means that God has given us. He says a revival is scientific. Okay? So we can have a revival anytime we want. We can tap into, into, into a revival so long as we are faithful. He also went and said this. God always answers the prayer of faith. Now, later that became the name it and claim it. Do we understand that? God will, he said, God will give you anything you want so long as you pray in faith. You want a revival? Pray in faith and God will give it to you. And some of his critics said, said to him, what about Jesus in Gethsemane? When he prayed that the cup may be moved from him. Didn't Jesus have faith? And Finney said this. Jesus did not pray that the cup may be moved from him. Jesus prayed that he may not, he may not die in Gethsemane. So the prayer of faith was answered. Now that is not the most impressive hermeneutic method. Okay. That is what we call scripture torture. Okay. That's, that's, what, that's what the Bible calls it, contortion. Right, but that was me. Now, according to this, that you can get God to do whatever we want if we have faith. That is, if we have enough faith, we can get God to do whatever we want. So now, dealing with this first part of Finney's statement, 
If you want a revival, you can have a revival. There is absolutely nothing supernatural about a revival. We can have a revival whenever we use the means of grace that God has given us. Now, it is very important in dealing with this uh, to know that the reason he was able to say this was because of his understanding of what evangelism success is. Do, do we understand that? The reason he was able to say this is based upon his understanding of what evangelism success was, or is for that matter. Let me explain this. Finney thought that evangelism success was attaining a person to make a decision for Christ. He believed that when a person makes a decision for Christ, believed that he believed that that person at that moment was saved, so he made getting the individual to make that commitment to God the prime objective. So the person, instead of setting his attention on Christ, that person is forced to set the attention on what he or she is going to do, namely accept Jesus into their hearts to be saved. Did we get that? So instead of the emphasis being in Christ's atonement, instead of the emphasis, instead of the point being Christ crucified for our sins and risen from the dead and his sufficiency to save, instead of the person being concentrating on that, the person was forced to think, would I go forward or not? Do we understand it? So, so by emphasizing the coming to the bench or coming forth, rather em than emphasizing Christ's sufficiency to say, we are forcing the person to think about the decision rather than the Savior who can save. Do, do we understand that? Now, many to this day follow that pattern. We hear that in many Baptist churches where the minister will say, if you hear the Holy Spirit speaking to you, come forward. Today is the day. And indeed it's true, today is the day. It's the day to come forward. It's the day to repent and believe. That also gives the, that, that also gives the impression that if you don't come forward, you lose your chance. Do, do we understand that? My point with this is that there are many methods today in evangelism. They are not from the Bible, but are the results of the ideas of man in the past. And that's what we need to understand. Now, Somebody will say, I, well, I got saved by saying the prayer. Right? And we say, amen, brother. You got saved not because of that methodology, but in spite of that methodology. And that we need to understand that. Yeah. It's not that, I don't think it's, it's a matter of it's not supposed to come forward. If you're, if you're convicted, you, you should seek a, a counsel from, from the pastors and the leaders in the church. That's not a problem with that. But we've got to make a decision between the clergy, in this case, and the people. Why? Because this is an admonition for 
teachers and preachers to be biblical. And it is an admonition for the people to understand what is a biblical call for the gospel. Okay? So the, our point is, we're not saying don't come up front. If you need prayer, the altar is open. We open the altar for prayer and counsel. But we're not saying come to the front to be saved. Because we don't know that. We don't know what is taking, the, in the, uh, what's taking place in the heart. So many of these methods, yes. Um, so, yeah, I, I will assume. I can only assume I, I cannot speak for them. I know some that, yes, that's one of the reasons. Because it's... Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, per se. Right. Although, though, I believe that the call must be made. Again, the altar call should be repent and believe. Repent and believe. Also, with... With this thinking, though, there's another side of this, this also. I'm referring to, 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 to the, the method of telling a person that he needs to accept Jesus and say the prayer, the sinner's prayer, right, we talked about last week. Another outcome of that is that many believe today that because they said the prayer, they're in the kingdom, and they go on living like the devil. And they looked upon that as a way of vaccination. That, that had happened, has happened to me when I go evangelizing. I have encountered people when I'm trying to share the gospel with them, and they stop me in my tracks and say, hold on. I'm already done did that. And many of times well, they'll sip in their beer or the Jack and Coke. And I'm serious. And I ask a question. What do you mean you already done did that? I'm talking to you about salvation. And they tell me, yes. So you're telling me you're saved? Yes. And I say, may I ask how you come to this conclusion? Oh, because you know what? A few years back, I was in the church, and I went out in the front, and I said the prayer. So these people truly, truly believed that because the minister told them that because they were saying the prayer, they were saved, they believed that. And to that, we add the misunderstanding of that other doctrine of once saved, you always saved. Hear me correctly. I didn't say the doctrine is, a, is, is false. I said the misunderstanding of the doctrine of once saved, always saved. Now I got your interest, huh? You want to open that can, can of worms? I, I open it for you. It seems important. You had a question, sister? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and I've told many, many people, and I think this church, this building, I'm going to talk about this building, and the doctrine right. used to be, you know, preached. Mm. And that was awesome. Right. So, and I told, and I see people, Christians, mm. truly Christians, living in Arizona. Right. That comes back to what I said. Maybe you missed that. I said, if you got saved like that, amen, brother, I said. But let me tell you that you did get saved, not because of that methodology, but in spite of it. So we're not saying that if you got saved like that and you truly bearing fruits, we're not putting in question your salvation. What, we, what we're criticizing is the method. What, what we need to understand, if, if God is saving somebody, okay, it comes back to what we're saying all along. If God is saving a person, God will save that person in, 
spite of whatever is gets in the way of that person getting saved. God will sometimes save, save persons even in the preaching of false teachers like Joel Austin. When they so happen to read a passage of scripture, the scripture takes place and gets a hold of the heart. The heart comes to faith. But that is in spite. Not because, but in spite. You see, that's, that's the point. Yes. Right. Mm hmm. Right. 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 And yeah. become a Christian, yeah. experience salvation. Yeah. Yeah. So what uh, yeah. how these people gonna know the Bible right. if they never said right. that, that that comes again to that. Um, the Bible says and come back to that, the Bible says right. that no one can be saved apart from the word. So if you don't hear the word, I'm sorry, you're not saved. Period. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah. Yeah, but again, we're not saying that the altar call must not be done. What we are saying is that we must not tell the people that the fact that they come forward is what's going to save them. Neither their decision for Christ, but it's Christ who will save them. So the focus must be always set on the Savior, the one who's sufficient to save like Paul said it, right? We read this passage last week in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17. I'll quote it off the back. Paul says, For Christ, and this is speaking about the word dividing exactly over doctrines and who baptized who, and there were divisions in the church and all these arguments and philosophies of men and all that, right? So Paul said, I am glad that I did not baptize none of you except, and he gives the names, of those who he baptized. Other than that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else, he said. For Christ did not send me to baptize, he said, but to evangelize, and that not with clever words of wisdom. And we stop there and ask the question, why? He says, so that the preaching of the cross may not be empty of its effects. So every time we said human cleverness or a methodology that is not in the Bible. We are setting a stumbling block between believers or believers to be people that are being convicted of their sins and Christ. That's what we need to understand. So it's a fair question to ask this. So then what is, what is the right methodology? That is the first, that's the question we need to ask. So again, what does the Bible say? Let us go to Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Yes, 1. Chapter 1, verse 15. And then somebody can look for Matthew chapter 4. I think it's verse 15. Okay, now this is Christ. Now, I'm going to do an argument from silence, okay? Uh, I'm going to explain what that is. I'm going to point what is not being said. Christ is not saying, the kingdom of God is at hand. I see the hand. Come out front. Are you ready to accept me to your heart? He doesn't say that. He says, repent and believe the gospel. Again, what does the Bible says? Uh, somebody found Matthew 4, 15, 15? Zebulun. Zebulun and the land of Nep Nephthali. Nephthali. 
Mm. <clears throat> yes, please. Right. John the Baptist, previous chapter. Repent and believe and keep fruit with repentance. Paul, in front of the Areopagus of Mars Hills in Acts chapter 17. What did he say to the Gentiles? He says, this man, speaking of Christ, the resurrection, speaking of the resurrection of Christ, he says, God has appointed to judge the world. Therefore, he says, God commands every man everywhere to repent and believe. Acts 14, Paul is speaking to the Jews, same. Repent and believe. So, the biblical methodology of evangelism is call people to repentance and to believe. And where do, we, where do we fit on that? What is our role? Right? Fair question? And please, feel free. We already went off our time, so feel free to leave whenever you like. But thank you for asking us questions. I like them, and I'm willing to answer. No problem, okay? This is what we're here for. So what do we say then? What is, what is our role in evangelism? Right? Preach the gospel. Let me take you to a passage that, that will, if God allows it, illuminate you and the understanding of what, what it takes to save a soul. Let us go to 1 Corinthians, chap, excuse me, beginning in chapter 2, begin, beginning in verse 9. And remember... The question is always this. What does the Bible say? Right? Now what I say or somebody else says, but what does the Bible say? That's the authority, right? So 1 Corinthians 2, beginning verse 9 through 14. Somebody wants to read that. Okay, a lot there, right? Let me draw your attention right quick. First, we see that the apostle is talking about things that no eye have seen, things that never enter the mind of any man. Now, you have heard, maybe, that preachers say that this is heaven, but it's not heaven. It's not heaven he's talking about. He's talking about the wisdom of God. In the context, if you read verse 8, it says that the rulers of this world did not understand this wisdom. Because if they had, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. So he's speaking about a blindness, a spiritual blindness, and also a lack of ability to, to penetrate the wisdom of God. Okay? So the question is begged in the argument. right? Logically, we ask this question. Then, by what means do we come to understand the wisdom of God? Right? Huh? The Spirit is there. Is there? You got that from the text. If you read it, it's right there. It says, These things, referring to the things of God, God has revealed to us through the Spirit. For the Spirit searches everything. So far, we have the way, 
and we have what it does. Right? The Spirit. So then we ask the question, what are the means that the Spirit uses to convey this knowledge? Right? Correct? Let us see. Verse 11. This is, a, this is an illustration, okay? What, he, what he's trying to say, he's trying to, to present to us how deep the Spirit goes and how important it is to understand that He is the only one who can allow us to penetrate the wisdom of God. Now he says, For who knows a person's thoughts except the Spirit there is in that person which is in him? So also, no one comprehends, listen, no one comprehends. Now, please understand. No person who is not in Christ, an unsaved person, a lost person, he cannot come to understand God. It's not only information that he needs. He needs something else. Okay? So let us keep reading. So it says, So also no one comprehends the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Now, this is the contrast. Please pay attention to the text. Now, that's the contrast. We have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand the things freely given to us by God. Okay, what is the implication here? In the context of the letter, the issue is that the Corinthians were searching for wisdom of man, philosophy, to improve the gospel. And what Paul is saying to them is this. Brothers, you did not come to faith by means of the intelligence of methods of men. Ask me, how do I know that? How do I come to that conclusion? Ask me that question, please. How do I know that? Let us go back to the beginning of the chapter. I'm holding my, my, my finger on this, <clears throat> on this and, and the verse we were in verse 13, but I'm coming back to that. But let me read what Paul says in regards of the transformation of the Corinthians. He says this, And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speeches or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now let us ask the question, why did Paul do that? Why didn't Paul bring lofty speeches of human philosophy. He was coming from Athens. If you read in Acts chapter 17 and 18, you will find out that Paul was coming from Athens, from the, from the, the pinnacle of human philosophy. He could have come, you know, lofty, you know, hi, I'm Paul, great speaker, you know, Pharisee of Pharisees, Benjamin, I circumcised in the eighth day. Listen to me, Corinthians. He didn't say that. Listen to what he says. He says, for I decided not to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness, in fear, and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not with plausible words of wisdom, but in a demonstration of the Spirit, of the power of God, so that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men but in the wisdom and the power of God. What is the point here? Right. It, it was in man-made methods. It was in man-made methods. It was the pure power of the gospel and the preaching of the cross. And that's, that, that is what I'm crying for. That, that, is, that is my point. Now, let us come back to uh, further to verse 13. 
So we established in verse 12, right, that we have received not the spirit of the world, but the, the spirit who comes from God, right? Correct? Right? Yes. Okay, now, as if we need it, he says this, and we impart these words. Listen, not being taught by human wisdom, by taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truth to those who are spiritual. What does that mean? The man who's dead, the man who's not regenerated, the man who's not born again, cannot believe in Christ. No matter what you do. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So Paul is flat out rejecting human methodologies and additions to the gospel. That's what he's doing. He's saying what Jesus said to Nicodemus. Have you ever wondered, seriously, John chapter 3, have you ever wondered, if you think about it, it's kind of rude, you know, Nicodemus is flattering Jesus pretty much. Rabboni, we know you're from God, right? For no one can do the things you do unless God was with him, right? Outstanding, outstanding uh, observation. Indeed, this is what theologians call the credit of the proponent. The, credi the credibility of the proponent. He was attested by God with miracles. No one can deny. Again, an argument from silence. Jesus doesn't say, Nicodemus, you're sharp. You got it. Come here and let me lead you into a prayer so you can you know, see the kingdom of God. What does Jesus say? I tell you the truth. That unless a man is born again of water. Water, Jewish context. Think, think Jewish. This is a Jewish rabbi to another Jewish rabbi. The scripture speaks of the water of the word of God. Okay? I tell you that unless a man is born of water and spirit, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, Nicodemus was not a dumb dumb. He was a scholar, a teacher of the law. He perfectly understood that what our Lord was telling him was impossible for a man to do. He was set in salvation beyond any human reach. It needed to come from God. My friends, we cannot cause a person to be born again, no matter what we do. If a person is born again, we must understand that that is a supernatural work of God. Again, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that we should not call people from the altar. I'm not saying that we should not do altar calls. But you see, there are things that God excuses in the light of ignorance. If you read in the same letter in 1 Corinthians in, in chapter 3, the apostle speaks of that. Uh, brother, you touched a little bit this morning on it, about, about building he says, as a skilled master, he says, I laid a foundation, says the apostle. But others are building upon that foundation. But no one can place another foundation but Christ Jesus. And then he gives this warning. He says, but each one must be careful how he builds. He says, with wood, hay, and stubble, or with precious stone, gold, and silver. For everyone's work will be tested on that day as though through fire. And what he has built, 
will stand or he will suffer loss. That is an admonition for teachers to build with precious stones. And you see, he gives six elements, wood, hay, and stubble. All three burn. Silver, gold, and precious stones do not burn. And then he gives a warning. That person will suffer loss, he says, but he himself will be saved as though through fire. Many of us, when we get there, we'll be like, whew, smoking, you know, whoa, whoa, you know, because we did a lot of unbiblical things in ignorance. Do we understand that? But we're not in ignorance anymore, brothers. Right? So, I'm not saying that we should not make altar calls. What I'm saying is we should make altar calls that are biblical. Call people, come to repent and believe. Believe in Christ. He can save you. If anybody has a question, if anybody's being tugged in his heart, come to see the pastor. Come to see us. We will counsel you. We will teach you what the Word of God says. Right? We remember that the call is not only to, um, what do you call it? Indulge me just for a few more minutes. When you examine the apostolic teachings, right, I'm talking about the, the teaching of the apostles. In theology, we divide those in two. The Didache, which is the didactic, that's the doctrinal session of the apostles, right? We read the epistles, right, and it's doctrine, Correct? That's the Didache. And then we have the Charisma. The Charisma is the proclamation of the apostles. So what happened is in the early church, they proclaim, people profess faith, immediately they began to be indoctrinated. And they began to be taught to expect the fruit of the Spirit. What was the fruit of the Spirit? What could you expect from your salvation? This is what's going to happen when you're saved. You can expect these things to take place in your life because lo and behold, whoever is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. It doesn't mean you're going to be perfect. It means that the old means you were blind before. You lived in sin. You, you wallow in, in the mire and you were happy. But now you're miserable because now you see how wretched you are and how much grace do you need on a daily basis. Right? So, 30 minutes above. But I, I appreciate this. Thank you so much because please ask questions. Ask questions. You get answers. Yes. Yeah. That all churches, all denominations can go to it. Which is like a like you call it the first like step. a fad that comes in, everybody's saying it. Yes. Say this prayer, but you like a fad. Yeah. Still saying the prayer right. Right. to accept the Lord. Yeah. Do, 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 do you remember when we study the, 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 the beginnings of the church and, the, and how the, many of the doctrines of the Catholic Church began to become become law and canon yes. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. No. Well, well, we all are ignorant when we're saved. Yeah. You know, maybe I'm being unfair in this, in this sense. Why do I know this? Because I came from that ignorance myself. Why do I have such a passion that we have clarity in the Bible? Because I lived in, in that ignorance for a long time. And by God's grace, I came across good teachers. Can I give you just the marks of a good teacher? Is this. He will seek to make much of Christ in his word. That is a good teacher. He will seek to make much of Christ in his word. That, that's the marks of a good teacher.
He will seek to build you up in the doctrine. He will always say, the Bible says, and he will seek to build you up, not to destroy you. But, you know, it's like our Lord said. He said, I am the good shepherd, and I lay down my life for my sheep, and I go before them, and I bring them forth. He says, but the higher hand sees the wolf coming, and he lifts the sheep because he's a higher hand, and the sheep gets scattered. I'm not a higher hand. Now they're my brothers that have leader, leadership in this church. They're not a higher hand. They love Christ. And it's because we love him and fear him that we uphold to sola scriptura, Bible alone. You know, so let us pray.